Over the last few segments, we looked at various pieces of information that we can gain from NMR data on our pathway here of ultimately trying to apply this information from NMR spectra along with IR data and mass spectrometry data in order to enable us to piece together the complete structures of unknown organic molecules that we have isolated from natural sources or that perhaps we have synthesized in a lab. What we are going to accomplish in this video is we are going to look at an overview of the steps that you can use for determining molecular structures by applying spectral data. This video is intended only as an overview of these steps. And what we will do is in the upcoming couple of videos, we will apply these steps towards solving actual problems. So right now what I'm gonna be going to give you is a workflow of how you can tackle taking spectral data and converting it into a molecular structure. And we will apply that information in the upcoming videos. You can access the information that I am displaying here on this page by finding the chapter 13 NMR handout, which is posted under the chapter 13 module. It is also available under files on Canvas. So you'll want to have this information handy. And what this walks through is the series of steps that are useful for determining the organic structures using spectral data. Keep in mind that this is very, very much puzzle solving, where you can think of the data as being the pieces of the puzzle that you will assemble into the complete chemical structure of an organic molecule using all of these different puzzle pieces, much like a logic puzzle. Some of you will love this. You will absolutely find it to be, dare I say it, fun. Others will find it to be rather frustrating. And in many ways, it is much like riding a bicycle or some other skill of that sort where... You find that it's very, very frustrating at first. You don't really know how to put all the pieces together. You don't know how to make the parts work or you don't know how to ride a block on the bicycle without falling off the bicycle. But as you practice this and you run into hurdles and overcome those hurdles, you will get more and more comfortable with determining the structures of organic molecules. And this is a skill that you will have the opportunity to demonstrate on the first project of the semester where you will be given the spectral data for a particular organic molecule, and you will use that information to propose to me what the structure of that compound is. So let's take a look at this general advice for finding organic structures using spectral data. The first step that I recommend is determining the molecular formula of the molecule. That is the number and type of atom that you see in the molecule. For example, c 6 H12O6 is a molecular formula. And that molecular formula you would determine using high resolution mass spectrometry generally here in this year, 2020. The typical experimental method for that would be the high resolution mass spectrometry, where remember that was the tool where we could determine the exact mass of the molecular ion out to several decimal places. And we can match that exact mass up by using a database with formula that particular exact mass would correspond to. And so since you won't have easy access to these types of databases for purposes of this course, what will happen is that you would generally be given the molecular formula of the organic molecule in question. So you would be given information like, we know the molecular formula is C6H12O6 from mass spectrometry. Now tell me what the structure of that is. So first off, take a look at the molecular formula of the molecule. A piece of information that we can gain simply by knowing the molecular formula is we can use that molecular formula to determine how many rings and or pi bonds must be present within the molecule. So we can even modify this a bit rather than just saying double bonds. We can change that to indicate the number of pi bonds. This is also referred to when we talk about the number of rings and pi bonds. You may have heard this synonymously referred to as the index of hydrogen deficiency. This was one of the concepts covered back in Organic 1, and it is super useful here because this index of hydrogen deficiency will be calculated using the formula listed here, where we could describe double bonds more broadly as pi bonds. And that sum of rings plus pi bonds will always be equal to taking two times the number of carbon atoms in the molecule that you're looking at, plus two, 
plus the number of nitrogen atoms in that molecule, minus the number of hydrogens, minus the number of halogens. So X in this formula equals your halogens. And divide that whole sum of the numerator here by two to determine the total number of rings and pi bonds. So whatever structure you draw, if it is the correct structure, will have that calculated sum of rings and pi bonds. This formula does not distinguish between whether the uh, index of hydrogen deficiency that you observe is due to rings or pi bonds. It just tells you it's one or the other or both. So if you had an index of hydrogen deficiency equal to two, that could mean you have two pi bonds. It could mean you have two rings. It could mean you have one ring plus one pi bond. But this is super useful because this will indicate to you what types of structural features your molecule absolutely must have based on evaluating the molecular formula. So if we did this, for our example molecular formula, that was C6H12O6 up there in the top right side of the page in red. The sum of the rings plus the pi bonds for C6H12O6 would be equal to two times the number of carbons, the number of carbons we said was six, plus two, following our formula here, plus the number of nitrogen atoms is zero, minus the number of hydrogen atoms, hydrogens are 12, so we subtract 12, and halogens, zero, so I subtract zero there, and I divide all of that by two. So doing that, two times six would be 12, plus two makes 14, 14 minus 12 makes two in the numerator divided by two in the denominator, two divided by two equals one. So that means that the correct structure for the molecule that we would be evaluating absolutely has to have one ring or one pi bond within it. So that gives us a piece of information to put into our puzzle of determining the structure of the organic molecule. From there, what I recommend doing next is look at the NMR spectral data that you have, and you will absolutely, for practice problems and for the project you'll be doing, have the proton NMR spectrum for the compound that you're evaluating. So you will evaluate that NMR information and simultaneous to that, you want to also pay attention to the IR data that you have. And when we are simultaneously looking at the NMR data and the IR data, what you will want to keep in mind is use the IR data to indicate the presence of specific functional groups. Functional groups that are very evident in IR spectra are hydroxy groups of alcohols. The hydroxy groups of carboxylic acids, which I abbreviate the carboxylic acid as COOH, and I'm gonna abbreviate carboxylic acid as CA for carboxylic acid, as well as the carbonyls of a variety of carbonyl containing functional groups, such as carboxylic acids, ketones, aldehydes, esters, amides, etc. And remember, when you are evaluating the IR data, your key piece of information that you'll want to refer to here is that table 12-2, which was provided in the bundle of handout information for chapter 12, and is also present in your textbook there in chapter 12 as well. So Evaluating the IR data, the main thing that you will want to look for is evidence for the presence or absence of these specific functional groups that very, very much stick out within the IR spectrum and are very clear and evident based on their location on the x-axis of that IR spectrum. So that will give you some evidence about what functional groups you are contending with in your molecule. And I would highly recommend when you are writing out these problems and trying to solve them, when you look at your IR data, label it or sketch out what functional groups you expect to see in your molecules so that you have that at the forefront of your mind, that if you see a signal at around 1700 and it's a really deep, strong signal, you anticipate that is a signal for a carbonyl group. And so you've got in the forefront of your mind that your molecule has to have a carbonyl group. And by the way, the carbonyl group would account for one index of hydrogen deficiency because of that pi bond, the double bond that connects the carbon and the oxygen. So you will use the IR data 
kind of simultaneous to the index of hydrogen deficiency that we calculated to start to piece together what is present within your molecule. So if you see an index of hydrogen deficiency of one and you see a carbonyl signal in your IR spectrum, you can bet that the index of hydrogen deficiency is accounted for by that carbonyl peak that you see. Along with that, in order to stitch together the entirety of the structure, know exactly what atoms are connected to what other atoms, you will need to apply the NMR spectral data. And that NMR spectral data, the key pieces of information that you will find from that, are you will want to keep in mind the three main items that we went over in earlier videos, where we looked at integrating the individual signals to determine the number of protons that correspond to each signal. So that will indicate to you, since those protons that correspond to a particular signal are all equivalent protons, meaning they are all symmetrical in the molecular bond into the same carbon, this will help you determine whether you are dealing with CH3, CH2, or CH groups that are bonded to a particular carbon. Because if it integrates to three, you can bet it's a CH3 group. If it integrates to two, you can bet it's a CH2 group. If it integrates to one, you can bet it's a CH group. And if it integrates to some multiple of that, it would indicate to you that there are multiple sets of those particular protons that are totally symmetrical to one another in a molecule. So that helps you start to piece together some of these individual groups where you have hydrogens bonded to carbons. From there, you can also take a look at the chemical shifts of those particular proton signals. That is where they end up at on the x-axis, because that will give you an indication of what the environment of that particular hydrogen that you've measured is. In other words, is it in a really electron withdrawing environment? Meaning that it's far downfield toward the left side of the spectrum closer to 14? Or is it a very shielded upfield signal that's closer to zero, meaning that it has electron donating groups nearby? And you can take a look at the provided chart from the chapter 13 handout to compare the chemical shifts that you see in your spectrum for an unknown compound to the chart to gain an idea about what functional groups are present within the molecule and where those um, functional groups reside, meaning what hydrogens are nearby those particular functional groups. Because if you have an oxygen that is close by a CH2 group, that oxygen is gonna cause the CH2 group hydrogens to be shifted downfield due to the fact that the oxygen is electron withdrawing by induction since oxygen is an electronegative atom. The other piece, the third piece of information from the proton and MR spectrum that makes it so valuable is what we refer to as the multiplicity or splitting pattern. That splitting pattern will tell us how many hydrogens are vicinal to the one that we are looking at, meaning how many hydrogens are on the adjacent carbon. And when we say that the hydrogens are on the adjacent carbon, what that means is they are separated, the hydrogens are separated by three bonds because if we think of these two protons that I've drawn out here, those two protons that I'm drawing the arrow to in the middle of the page are vicinal, meaning they are separated from one another by three bonds. One, two, three. So on the adjacent carbon, in other words. And so that will give us an indication about what's next door to the particular proton that we have measured. And so if we were measuring the signal for a CH3 group and it showed up as a triplet, that indicates there has to be a CH2 group next door to it because we apply the N plus one rule that we learned about in the previous video to determine that if we have a CH3 group and there's two vicinal hydrogens, we take two plus one, which makes three, meaning the signal would be a triplet. So we look at these three pieces of information together, the integral, the chemical shift, and the splitting pattern to determine the nature of each individual proton and deduce what group is next door to that particular proton. And by applying this throughout the spectrum for all of the hydrogens that are present, we can stitch together the bonds that are found within that molecule to determine a complete chemical structure. So at the end of the problem, by applying this information all together, we should be able to come up with a complete chemical structure for our molecule. Another bit of information that is handy to keep in mind as we are doing this 
is the functional groups that we learned about back within Organic One will come back to be a huge advantage to you, or they can come back to be a big adversary to you if you don't know them very well. So functional groups are referred to as such because those are really common themes that we run across time and time again when we're looking at structures of organic molecules. They're the common patterns that atoms bond in. And so generally when we're solving structures, we will see those common patterns in place. And so if you are looking at a molecule, and for example, it has both a nitrogen and an oxygen found in it, in an index of hydrogen deficiency of one, you could make a pretty decent bet that a strong possibility is that the structure has an amide functional group. And so if you remembered that an amide functional group is a common theme that is observed within organic molecules, and you notice the molecular formula had a nitrogen and an oxygen, then you could be on the lookout for evidence for that amide functional group, such as seeing a carbonyl signal in the IR spectrum and seeing that the sum of rings and pi bonds allowed for there to be a pi bond in the molecule and finding NMR data that support that conclusion based on the chemical shift values that you are seeing. So keep in mind the functional groups, keep those at the forefront. Those are provided for you back in chapter two if you need to go back and refresh on those. But those will definitely form a framework for thinking about how atoms are likely to assemble together to make the organic structures that we are looking at. And what you will do with all of this information holistically is using it like puzzle pieces to put together the atoms in reasonable combinations where ultimately the correct structure will fit all of the data that are available. If one or more of your pieces of data don't really make sense, like you've proposed that there's a carbonyl group in the structure you've drawn, but there is no carbonyl signal in the IR spectrum, that means you need to go back to the drawing board and adjust something. Because if you have created the correct structure, logically, all of these data will make sense. They will all support the structure that you've drawn. If one or more things don't make sense, pieces of information are missing, meaning that you aren't seeing signals that you would expect to see in the IR spectrum or elsewhere, that means you need to go back to the drawing board. Yes, the process involves quite a bit of trial and error. That is common. It exists even for me that I start down a road in solving the structure of an organic molecule and have to go back and revise and try again. Um, but at the end of solving a problem, you want to make sure that all of the data that you have used all make sense and add up to the structure that you have created. There's trial and error, there's practice involved. And as you practice on this, you will get faster at solving these and the process of solving them will become more and more methodic and become hopefully more like a fun puzzle than a torturesome puzzle. So what we'll look at in the next video is we are going to apply this general information that we just went through towards solving a couple of actual structures.